right. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Um, it's Wednesday here in, in Vancouver, Canada, at the, uh, in the studio at the uh, Canadian College of English Language. And I am Sean. I'll be your teacher for the next hour. I see some familiar names over here in the chat. It's good to see everybody. Uh, Marianne, I see Chase back. Who else is in there? Lots of people, lots of new, it looks like we've got some new faces and new names here. It's great. Good to see you. So, yes, yeah, Wednesday afternoon here. I'm not sure where it is or, or what time it is where you are, but I hope you're doing well. And I hope you're ready. Um, we are going to jump right into it. Um, usually, we've got Lane as the moderator uh, for the class, but Lane is away this week and next week. So Mark, who a lot of you probably know from the Facebook group or from his own class, Mark is going to be the moderator today. So, okay, some people are ready. Good. Rosa's here. Hi, Sean. She says, hi, Rosa. Ahmed is ready. Okay, good. I'm ready too. So if you guys have questions during the class, just put your questions in the chat. Karim's here too. Good to see it. Put your questions in the chat and we will try to answer your questions uh, as best we can, as often as we can, okay? Um, let's get rolling. Let's jump right into it. So, where'd I go? Here I am, okay. So today, today's class is going to be on a specific area of writing skill. Um, it could be in a way applied to, to speaking, but it's, it's really more about writing. And it's what we call misplaced modifiers, okay? So some of you may have heard about misplaced modifiers before. This may be something completely new to you. I know that as a native English speaker, as a person who always did well in English class in high school and who studied uh, English in university, I didn't know what a misplaced modifier was until I got into, into university, actually. So if you have no idea what this is, don't worry, because that's, that's why I'm here, okay? We're going to walk through it. Um, Bruno's here too. Hey, Bruno. Good to see you. All right, so lots of people here, lots of people ready. I'm ready. Let's talk about it. So misplaced modifiers, where should we start? Well, let's start with first the word modify, okay? Modify is the, the word of the day, all right? So what does modify mean? Modify, to modify something means to make small minor changes to something, usually um, in order to improve it. If you want to make something better, you can modify M minor changes, okay? And you can use this verb modify for many different things, okay? What types of things can you modify? Well, you can modify a recipe, right? You can take a recipe for delicious cookies and you can modify it by adding some different type of ingredient to it, perhaps. Oats, make it healthy, for example. Okay, so that's modifying. What else can you modify? Well, there's Obama. I guess, well, politicians can, or anybody, can modify their view or to modify their stance or their argument about a certain issue, to change it slightly, um, especially if you want to get more popular. You might have to modify your views. What else? Well, of course, teachers. I, I guess I didn't need a picture of a teacher. I'm a teacher. I just I could have used myself. But teachers can modify lessons. A teacher sometimes has to change the lesson in order to make it appropriate or good for the students they're teaching. And of course, a little bit cooler than that, you can modify a car. You can modify the engine. Or in Vancouver, Lots of people, lots of bicycles in Vancouver. Lots of people like to modify their bicycles, change it, put you know, a special seat on it. I don't know. I don't, I don't really ride the bicycle very much. I prefer to walk. So I don't modify a bicycle, but many people do. All right, so this is where we're going to start. But we're not talking about modifying cars or we're not talking about making cookies today, unfortunately. Maybe next week I'll, I'll talk about how to make, how to make good cookies. But today we're talking about modifying, okay? And in, in particular, we're talking about what we call modifiers in the English language um, in terms of grammar, okay? There's a specific thing in language that we refer to as a modifier. So, 
what is a modifier is the first question. Okay, good question, yeah? So a modifier is a word, a phrase, or a clause that changes or describes another part of a sentence. So modifier is a large category. It's a very broad category of words and phrases and clauses in English or maybe even in your own languages that we use to describe or change other parts of the sentence. Other words, other phrases, other clauses. Okay, so let's look at, let's look at some specific examples here. Okay, so specific words, even if you don't know the word modifier in terms of grammar, you probably know these examples of modifiers, okay? So let's go back to this bicycle, all right? So the bicycle, simple. The bicycle is a noun. If I want to get more specific, I want to describe the bicycle, I can say the new bicycle, okay? Now in this case, the word new is changing bicycle a little bit. It's describing it, it's making it more specific. Therefore, new is a modifier. So adjectives are modifiers, right? So an adjective is in the category of modifier. And of course you can add uh, more adjectives to this. You could say the cool new bicycle, right? Two adjectives describing bicycle, kind of restricting bicycle, and therefore both of these are adjectives. Both of them are modifiers. Okay, so that's one type of modifier. Let's put another sentence up here about this bicycle. Um, I'm going to be talking about this bicycle for a lot, for a, little, a lot, for a little, a little bit here. So bear with me. He rides his bicycle. Well, that's nice. Mark often rides his bicycle to work, I think, or he used to. I don't know if he still does. Okay, so if I want to get more specific, I can say he rarely rides his bicycle. Okay, so maybe you guys can ask Mark in the, in the chat if he, if he often rides his bicycle or, or if he rarely rides his bicycle. So in this case, the word rarely, again, is modifying the verb ride. Therefore, adverbs are modifiers. Okay, and I see that Mark still rides his bike. That's good. Good for him. Good for the city. Good for the world. Good for the trees and everybody. All right, so those are the words. Phrases. Lots of different phrases can be modifying phrases as well, okay? So back to the bicycle. You can get more specific and you can say the bicycle in the hallway, all right? So in the hallway is a phrase, again, describing bicycle, explaining bicycle, and therefore that phrase is a modifier, okay? This specific type of phrase, we call this a prepositional phrase, meaning a phrase that has a preposition and a noun together. So prepositional phrases are modifiers. Okay. And of course, as I said, you've got clauses. So let me throw you a clause. The bicycle, that is leaning against the wall. So in this case, this entire adjective clause is a modifying clause. It's describing bicycle. And we talked a couple weeks ago about adjective clauses. Well, they fit into this large category of modifiers, okay? In fact, if you look really closely at this adjective clause, there are actually two modifiers in this one clause, right? So if you look at it closely, you'll see that is leaning is a relative clause describing bicycle, and against the wall, that's actually a prepositional phrase, but together they are both describing the bicycle. So that's all modifying the bicycle, okay? Good, so again, if you have questions coming up, put them in the chat and we'll try to get to them, okay? This is good, so to sum up, all right? Oh, actually, before I sum up, remember a couple weeks ago, we said that when you're looking at the adjective clauses, oftentimes that is, who is, which is, you can take those out of there and you can shorten it up and it becomes the bicycle leaning against the wall. Now that's still a modifying um, participle clause is what we talked about a couple weeks ago. Okay, so this is just the beginning. This is 
introducing this concept of modifier so that we can talk about how to avoid mistakes with these words, phrases, and clauses. Okay? So, Rasha has a question, and it's Ernt. Don't we use modifiers in our language spoken every day? Of course we do, yes. Yes, we do. Um, obviously, modifiers are for spoken English as well. Um, usually, maybe the, if, uh, maybe your question is, why am I saying that this is a writing lesson? Because this is um, where students often have trouble with their academic writing or their writing assignments. But you're absolutely right. We use modifiers all the time in, spe in, in speech and in writing, for sure. Good question. Okay, so to sum up, modifiers. Words like adjectives and adverbs. Phrases like prepositional phrases. Clauses like adjective clauses and participle clauses. All right, these are all modifiers. Now, why are we talking about this? Well, because it's important to understand modifiers so that you understand how to use them and how to avoid making mistakes, okay? So if you look at this whole sentence that I've written for you, there was a cool new bicycle. So there was a cool new bicycle leaning against the wall in the hallway outside my apartment. If you really look at a sentence, in this sentence specifically, most of the sentence is modifiers, right? There was a bicycle is really the main part of the sentence. Everything else is detail, is modifiers. So it's important to be able to identify the part of a sentence that is a modifier. But it's also important to know what the modifier is modifying. Okay, so look at the words cool and new. Obviously, cool and new are describing bicycle. Okay, the participle leaning is also describing bicycle. The bicycle was leaning, okay? But also here you've got against the wall is a modifier, and that's describing the word leaning. In the hallway is describing the word wall, and outside my apartment is modifying hallway. So it's really important when you're looking at the sentence to know what words are modifying what other parts of the sentence. Okay? So, good. The reason for all of this is the misplaced modifier. This is a very common mistake that students make in their writing and in speech, of course, but in writing it's more noticeable because you can see it and you can't uh, kind of go back and, and fix it like you can in speech. But the misplaced modifier is what we're talking about today, okay? So what is it? A misplaced modifier is exactly what it sounds like. It is a problem with word order, all right? That means that you're putting a word or phrase or clause in the wrong part of a sentence. The modifier is in the wrong place, and that's a problem. And it, or it can be a, a quite a serious problem in, in your sentence because it can affect the meaning or the coherence of your sentence. Now last week, we talked about um, coherence, which means does my writing make sense? Do my sentences make sense? Can you understand my sentences? If you have a problem with where your modifiers are in the sentence, it may make it harder for the reader to understand your sentences because it can affect the meaning of your sentence, and we're gonna look at that today. Okay, so, oh, this is nice. Look how happy they are. So let's talk about these ladies in the garden, okay? Let me, th let me talk to you about misplaced modifier. Let's, let's look at an example. They only want to grow tomatoes in their garden. Well, that's nice. Um, why wouldn't they? they? The tomatoes look lovely. This looks like a fine sentence. This is actually the type of sentence that even a native speaker p would possibly write without realizing that it's a mistake. Okay? And there's a, there's a problem in this sentence with the placement of a modifier. So you have to look at the sentence first and find the modifiers. So what words are modifiers in this sentence? Well, the first one I see is 
only. And this little adverb here is a misplaced modifier. It's a mistake. Okay? It's a mistake because when we say they only want to grow tomatoes in their garden, that means that means they don't want to sleep, they don't want to go out, they don't want to spend time with their children, which is terrible, they don't want to eat, right? They only want to grow tomatoes in their garden. When you put this word only next to want, that is the word that is being modified, okay? And that's the meaning of this sentence. It sounds like um, a crazy obsession, all right? They're, they're going crazy about these tomatoes, which I guess is possible, but they don't seem, they don't seem quite so crazy. So let's, let's change the position of this word only. We don't want to say they only want, because they probably want more than just to grow tomatoes, okay? So let's move it around. Let's put it, um, let's put it here. Now I'm saying they want to only grow tomatoes in their garden. Now, that's also a problem, okay? I've changed it, I'm getting closer, but this is also a misplaced modifier because now I'm saying that they want to only grow. So they don't want to eat tomatoes in the garden. They don't want to touch or smell tomatoes in the garden. They want to only grow tomatoes in their garden, okay? So in this case, it still doesn't quite work. And now you see how one little adverb in the sentence, depending on where it is, can really affect the meaning of the sentence. Okay, so let's, let's try another way, okay? How about this? They want to grow only tomatoes in their garden. Now in this case, this is okay, this is fine now, because what I'm saying, and I think this makes sense, they don't want to grow carrots, they don't want to grow zucchini, or anything else. They want to grow only tomatoes in the garden. Now the, the modifier is modifying the word tomatoes, and that modifier only is as close to tomatoes as it possibly can be, and now it makes, it makes sense. Now I see somebody up here. Who said something about only in, the, only in the garden? Oh, maybe Marianne said that. They want to grow tomatoes only in their garden. Now, yeah, if you put only in their garden here, again, that would be a little bit of a misplaced modifier because you would be saying they don't want to grow tomatoes in their bedroom, um, in the kitchen, uh, in the, in the backseat of their car. They just want to grow tomatoes only in the garden. So I think this sentence is the best use of this modifier. So the message I'm trying to give you guys right now is be careful where you place certain adverbs. Well, adjectives as well, but these guys only, almost, nearly. These types of adverbs of um, restricting or limiting adverbs are really common to be placed in the wrong part of the sentence and um, it can kind of totally change the meaning of the sentence. Okay, so be careful of that. But we're not done. This is just, this is just the beginning, okay? Um, how about this one? There was a book on a shelf that I hadn't seen since my childhood. There was a book on a shelf that I hadn't seen since my childhood. Okay, so take a look at this sentence. What's the problem? Is there a problem with the modifiers? Well, first, what are the modifiers in this sentence? Okay, find me the words, the phrases, the clauses that are modifying different parts of the sentence. Well, let me see here. What do we got? We've got on the shelf is a modifier. Okay. Um, that I hadn't seen. That's a modifying clause. And since my childhood. Okay. Three modifiers in this, in this one sentence. On the shelf. That I hadn't seen since my childhood. Okay. Now, Rose is asking, is there any rule to place modifiers or no? Yes, there is. Absolutely, there is. There are always going to be um, exceptions to the rules, Rosa, but we will definitely talk about um, the rules in a, in a moment. And the rules are quite simple, and I'll tell you what the rules are in about two minutes or so, okay? So, 
I think Paul's kind of got it. I think Paul saw it. It's the, the, the shelf. Okay, so in this case, the problem is with that I hadn't seen since my childhood. Well, that or on the shelf, either one of those is kind of misplaced because there's a problem here. In this sentence, the clause that I hadn't seen since my childhood, I'm probably trying to talk about um, the book. I think I mean the book that I hadn't seen since my childhood. But the way that my sentence is organized here, I'm actually saying that it's a shelf that I hadn't seen since my childhood. Because shelf is a noun that's closer to that clause. So if, you're, if your modifier is too far away from the thing it's modifying, then it can create a problem. So here I'm saying that this is some kind of shelf I hadn't seen since my childhood. So that's not what I mean. So how are we going to change it? Let's, let's play with the order a little bit. This is what I would do. I think I would take it and I would flip it like that and say, on the shelf, there was a book that I hadn't seen since my childhood. Now that clause, that modifying clause, is next to the book. It's as close as you can get to that noun. And shelf is way over there. And now this sentence is clear and could not really be confused. Okay, so the point is to make your sentences as clear as possible. You guys still talking about the tomatoes? <laughs> yeah. You guys are talking about how tasty the tomatoes are? Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's fine. They were good looking tomatoes, I know. And if, if I had tomatoes like that, maybe I would only want to hang out in the garden with my tomatoes. But So in this case, this shelf the shelf is over here, the book is closer to this clause, and now everything is, is wonderful. Okay, so let's look at one more example, and then I'm going to get you guys to do uh, some work. Okay, so check out this picture. Here's the sentence. Swimming around in the pond, the children fed the ducks. Now, <laughs> this is the type of sentence that can really um, affect the meaning if you get the order wrong here, okay? So at the beginning of this sentence, you've got what we call a participle clause, swimming around in the pond, okay? Now the thing to remember about this is that when you're using participle clauses, they have to be, again, as close to the thing they're modifying as possible. Now in this sentence, what I'm saying is that the children were swimming around in the pond, feeding the ducks. I mean, that maybe that's, that's possible. I personally would not probably swim in a duck pond. I've seen some, some pretty gross looking duck ponds out there. But in this picture, clearly you see that the children are not in the water. The ducks are swimming around in the pond. So again, you have to make sure that the order of your sentence is clear. Because when you're using these participle clauses, you don't see the subject right? The subject is, is implied, it's suggested. So the subject has to be the closest noun here, the noun that's being modified. So let me flip it around. How about this? The children fed the ducks swimming around in the pond. So now the ducks were swimming around the pond. Swimming around the pond is as close to the ducks as possible. Now it's clear, it's not it's not confusing anymore. And yeah, I see that Che got it too. Che got in there before I did. Good. All right. Good stuff. Okay, so just to make it clear, now Rosa was asking about the, um, the rules. And now the rules are simple. Now we have rules about adjective order and that kind of stuff, but um, we can talk about that maybe later or another time. But for modifiers in general, this is the rule, okay? How to avoid making this mistake? Follow these steps. One, look at the sentence and find your modifiers. You have to be able to identify the words and the phrases and the clauses in your sentence that modify other parts of the sentence. Okay, so find your adjectives, find your phrases. Step one. Step two, find the thing they are modifying. Okay, so if you see the word blue, 
look around for the word that blue is describing. So blue book, for example, okay? And then make sure that the position of the modifier is, is clear, that the sentence is clear, that if you look at the sentence, there's no possible way that the reader would be confused about what you're saying. Now, the easiest way to avoid confusion is this. Ask yourself this question. Is your modifier as close as possible to the thing it is modifying? So in all of those examples I showed you before, the problem was that the modifier was too far away from the word that it was supposed to be describing. If you get those two things as close as they can be, they won't always be side by side, but get them as close as they can be, and you will avoid this mistake, okay? I see David putting up some ad adjective order, that's good. Yeah, that's good stuff, that's good to know. I, you guys can copy that from the chat and put that somewhere and, and uh, use it as reference. Obviously, there are sometimes going to be some exceptions to the adjective order, but that's a good thing to know. So uh, thanks, David, for that. Okay, so that's the golden rule. Just make sure that your modifiers are as close to the thing they're modifying as possible, and that should be okay, but you also want to avoid what we call ambiguity, um, lack of clarity. Okay, look at, this poor, <laughs> look at this poor guy here. All right, let me take a little sip of my water. I got ice in there, I shouldn't have ice. Ah, there we go. Okay, so this poor guy, look at this sentence. Eating quickly gave him a stomach ache. This is a problem. This is a problem because of a lack of clarity, not just because he has a stomach ache, but this sentence is not as clear as it could be because if you look at it, if you find the modifier quickly, there's your adverb. The problem with the position of this adverb is that I don't know if quickly is modifying eating, as in he, he ate quickly, right? Or is it modifying gave, he quickly gave. So maybe he ate slowly, but then as soon as he was finished, he quickly got that terrible pain in his stomach. Or maybe he just ate his lunch like a, like a wolf, like a wild animal, and then was immediately sick. So you have to be careful with that unclear position of modifiers as well. Now in this case, really, I would just recommend rewriting the, uh, the sentence, okay? So, I would write this instead. After eating, he quickly got a stomach ache. So in this case, after eating is a modifier, and it's actually modifying the whole sentence, right? So after eating, he quickly got a stomach ache. That position is fine, that's good. And also now you've got the adverb quickly, which is a modifier, and now it's modifying got, okay? So he quickly got a stomach ache, and now you know, and now everything is wonderful, and you look at the, at the order of everything here, and it's great, and everybody's happy, except for this guy, obviously, because he feels terrible, all right? So let's not be too happy, because he's in, he's in a lot of pain, okay? So, he had a stomach ache. He had a stomach ache from eating too quickly. From Paul, that's perfect. That's great, Paul. Good. Okay, so, that's basically it for misplaced modifiers, guys. That's, that's how you avoid this problem, all right? So, let's see if we can uh, practice this, okay? So time to get to work. I'm going to pop out of here, and this is what I'm gonna do. All right, is this, this is the student copy. So I'm gonna take that. All right, I just put a link for the document that you guys can open up, or you can just look onto my screen here. I'll, I'll try to make it as, as big and clear as possible, okay? So I've got about 10 sentences, all right? You can um, go into that link if you want, or just look onto the screen, and I'm gonna see um, if you guys can find the problem with the misplaced modifiers. Okay, so the instructions are, if the following sentences contain misplaced modifiers, 
correct them, okay? The, the keyword being if. So you have to find the modifiers, decide what are they modifying, are they as close as possible as they can be, is there any confusion, and if there's a mistake, you have to change the order of the sentence to avoid the mistake. Okay? So, yeah, if, if you guys, if you're having a hard time reading it off the screen, I suggest going up to the, to the link in the chat, guys, and go right into the, into the document, and you'll be able to see it, okay? Again, I'll see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Yeah, that's a little bit too, too much, I think, or I'm gonna lose the, I'm gonna lose most of it. So I'm gonna take it down one, but this is what I'll do. We'll go over one together, then we'll do a few, you guys can do a few on your own and I'll um, pop out, okay? So let's do number one together and then I'll disappear for a bit. I'll put the happy uh, dancey monkey music thing on and then you guys can get to work. So workers have nearly restored the entire building. This one is a tricky one because of that word um, nearly. Valerie's, she's late. It's okay, Valerie. You're, hi, welcome. You know, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have known you were late, actually. I would, I would have had no idea. Okay, so in this case, workers have nearly restored the entire building. Now, the problem with this adverb here is that I don't want it to modify restore, okay? Because they didn't nearly restore. They were restoring the building, but they're not quite finished, okay? So I would take this and I would move it over here. Okay, just like that. So the workers have restored nearly the entire building. Not the whole thing, but almost the entire building. And now the order of your sentence is wonderful, okay? So get to work. You got 10 sentences there. Some of them are maybe trickier than others. I'm gonna put the music on there. You guys get to work. When you have an answer, put it in the chat, and then we'll go over it together as one big, one big happy family. Okay, so I'm gonna pop off the screen here and put on the music. And if you have questions, also put them in the chat, okay? All right, get to work.
de, 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 de. All right, everybody. I know that not all of you are done, but that's okay. I thought I would pop in here to check up on everybody and see how you're doing. Maybe go over some of these, and then the rest we can go over um, together. Okay. I see lots of good answers coming in on the chat. Um, some of these are quite tricky, just because I like to uh, I like to torture you a little bit. I like to make you sweat, right? Make you work. Um, some of them are a little bit easier than others. Okay. So let's. Let's talk about the first few. I think some of you got all the way down to eight and nine, but we'll, we'll go over these together, okay? So the first one we did. Now number two, some of these um, misplaced modifiers will really create kind of a, a, a funny, perhaps funny image in your head. Um, number two says she wore a hat on her head, which was much too big. Now obviously the problem with number two is that in this case, which was much too big, this modifier, um, is too close to the word head. So now I'm suggesting in this sentence that um, her head was much too big, which is maybe true, but what I probably mean is that the hat was much too big. So let me go over here. Let me, let me see, where is, somebody gave me an answer for that one. All right, this one I'll put up here. Um, this one's coming in, I think, from um, Khaled, maybe Khaled, put this one here. She wore, I think, take out of there, she wore on her head a hat which was much too big. Now, that's not bad. That's pretty good. I think I would capitalize that. She wore on her head a hat which was much too big. Yeah, that's okay. This, I would even say that this prepositional phrase here isn't totally necessary because really, I mean, where do you wear a hat other than, <laughs> other than not, uh, other than on your head, right? So you could probably take this right out of there, okay, and say she wore a hat which was much too big. Um, you could say on her head she wore a hat which was much too big as well. Maria, hi Maria, is saying the hat that she wore on her head was too big and that is, that is perfect, that's great. Thank you for that. Russia is saying she wore a too big hat on her head. Now I wouldn't use too and big with, as, with an adjective before the noun like that, um, Russia, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, just the hat, the hat was too big works, but a too big hat, we can't say that, okay? Somebody's, David's going to the Kentucky, Kentucky Derby, <laughs> okay. So, number three, again, this one's kind of ridiculous. It says, climbing up a tree in the backyard, my grandmother saw her lost cat, Skittles, <laughs> okay? So, in my sentence, my grandmother is climbing up a tree in the backyard, and maybe, she, maybe because she's up in a tree, she can see her cat. Um, far away, but that's probably not, again, what I mean. Um, yeah, my grandmother wouldn't, wouldn't climb trees. And I think coming in from, this one's coming in from Paul. Said this one, let me put this up here. And he said, my grandma, well, he got even, even more uh, casual here with that. My grandma saw her lost cat Skittles climbing up a tree in the backyard, you could say that, right? So yeah, you just flip the order a little bit, okay? I would capitalize Skittles though, because that's, that's the name, all right? So Grammy, Grammy saw her lost cat Skittles climbing up a tree, perfect. Now number four, I don't know if anybody gave me number four, because number four is quite a tricky one, all right? So despite the stereotype, all Canadians are not hockey fanatics, of course. That, some of you thought that maybe that, of course, needs to be moved around, and it could be. You could say, despite the stereotype, of course, and then continue, if you want to. But that's not the problem. And I think, I think somebody got it. I think, um, who found it there? CFT Teaching, I think, found it perhaps, okay? So the problem is the order here of all Canadians are not. So if you say all 
Canadians are not. That means no Canadians are hockey fanatics. And I can promise you something. Um, a lot of Canadians are hockey fanatics. But not all Canadians are hockey fanatics. So in this case, not and all have to be together. Not all Canadians aren't, but not all Canadians are. Okay, so that was a little tricky one. I threw you a little, a little curveball. Although that's, I guess that's a baseball analogy. I should be, I should be talking about hockey. I don't know what the 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 equivalent is in hockey. Okay, so what else do we got here? Number five. Several of my classmates had almost read the whole book in one weekend. Now again, this is a tricky one that's similar to um, nearly or only, right? You've got this almost here. So you didn't, they didn't almost read the book. If they almost read the book, that would be like they, well, if you, this is my phone, if you, you almost read a text, but you, you don't, maybe you drop your phone or something, or somebody comes in, so you don't read it. So they didn't almost read, but they read almost the whole book. And a few people got that answer. Let me give an answer. Who put that one? This one's coming in from, is it Joko? Where we go here? All right. There. So several of my classmates had read almost the whole book. That's, that's the correction there. And that is, that's great. OK? Good. Again, guys, if you guys have any questions about anything I'm saying, get, put the questions in the chat here. This is good. OK. Good, good, good. So let's look at a few more here. Again, number six is a tricky one, too. In North America, many students graduate with debt from university worth tens of thousands of dollars. Now, I think a few people got it. I think, OK, Marianne got it. So I'll put Marianne's answer up here. OK, I couldn't, I couldn't trick her. I like to trick you guys sometimes. But the problem is this area here of the sentence. The phrase from university should be closer to graduate. So you don't graduate with debt from university, but you graduate from university with debt. Or well, hopefully, hopefully you don't. But if you do, that's how you would express it, OK? Like so. So in North America, many students graduate from university with debt worth tens of thousands of dollars. OK, good. Well, not, not good. The debt is not good, but good answer from Mary <laughs> Thank you for that. OK. Now, number seven, again, a lot of, a lot of good answers coming in. Now, number seven, I, I kind of tried to trick you a little bit, too, because I didn't mention this. But um, oh, yeah, also, I guess I should have mentioned at the beginning, at the beginning of the exercise, I said, if these sentences have problems with modifiers, the truth is, every one of them has a problem with a modifier. None of them are correct. They're all wrong, OK? In fact, number seven has two mistakes, OK? Two mistakes. Um, broken into several pieces, my father was fairly certain that the guitar could only be fixed with glue. There are two misplaced modifiers in this case. So obviously, some of you found that with broken into several pieces. Um, <laughs> my father was not broken into several pieces. OK, so I, I saw a, a few people put that in here. OK, so I would say, I'm going to, yeah, how about this? I'll just move this one around. So my father, my father was fairly certain that the guitar Space there, broken into several pieces, could only be fixed with glue. So what's the what's the other mistake? Where's the other mistake in this sentence? Did anybody find it? Maria saying the guitar was broken in several pieces. My father was fairly certain it could only be fixed with glue. Now that's pretty good, but there's still a mistake in this sentence. 
Okay, Azim. My father was fairly certain that the guitar broken into several pieces could be could only be fixed with glue. Now that's good, but there's still another misplaced modifier in there. Does anybody see it? A lot of people are coming in with the same very very similar answers. Okay, so the problem is only. Okay. And yeah, I see Mark is saying that in the, in the chat there too. Only is a misplaced modifier. Because it can't, I, I don't mean it can only be fixed with glue, but it can be fixed only with glue. All right? Only should be modifying this phrase with glue here. Okay, so you have to be careful of those adverbs. For only okay, a couple more here. How are we doing for time? Okay, we got some good. We got some time. Okay. Now number eight, another tricky one because I'm trying to to torture you guys. Okay, one word in this entire sentence. Most nutritionists would agree that a cold bowl of cereal does not give a child the energy and nutrients they need to do well in school. There is one word in number eight that it, that needs to be in the wrong in in a different place. It's in the wrong place. I don't know if anybody got it, but because we're running a little bit um, uh, behind on time, a little bit short on time, I'm going to put it up here. Me Marianne, okay. Most nutritionists would agree that a cold bowl of cereal does not give the energy and nutrients a child needs to do well in school. Okay, so the trick for number eight is that cold, okay? The problem is the bowl is not cold, all right? The cereal is cold. So bring that over here like so. So most nutritionists would agree that a bowl of cold cereal does not give a child the energy and nutrients they need, okay? So just be careful of little things like that. Good. And two more here. I don't know if I got any more answers for that, for um, number nine. Did I get anything for nine? Okay, so the student threatened the teacher who had not passed the test. In this case, I'm just going to go over these last two answers really quickly, just so we have enough time for one more thing before you guys go. I'm going to take this. The problem is that the teacher did not not pass the test, right? The problem here. So obviously, the student, the student who had not passed the test threatened the teacher. Not, not very nice, but that's, that's right. The teacher, <laughs> the teacher threatened, okay, Chase answer. The teacher threatened the students who had not passed the test. Well, <laughs> that's grammatically correct, Jay. And, and not, it's not my style, but I guess it, it could work, maybe. It could work. <laughs> that was good. Okay. And the last one, number 10, in order to escape, they were forced to climb a large fence behind the prison covered in razor wire. Okay, so the problem with this one again is this modifying phrase here, or a participle clause, I guess I should say, covered in razor wire, kind of like barbed wire. Um, I don't think the prison was covered with razor wire. Actually, what we mean take that out of there and put that here, okay? So in order to escape, they were forced to climb a large fence. The fence is the noun that was covered in razor wire. So the large fence covered in razor wire behind the prison, okay? And that um, is it for, for misplaced modifiers. Now all the modifiers are in the right place and everything is wonderful once again. All right, Mark is scary, I agree with that. Yeah? <laughs> so, that's it for misplaced modifiers. We've got a couple more minutes. Now there was one other thing that I wanted to talk about with it, another uh, modifier issue, but that's okay. We're gonna save that for a different class. So, how about this? Oh, Valerie's asking what is fence? Maybe Karim or, or Mark can give a definition in there. Fence is just the 
Wow, so many different types of fences, I guess, Valerie. I mean, the fence would be like a, like a, a kind of wall, almost, usually built from either wood or, or chain that separates property, right? You might have a fence around your, your house or your property to keep uh, people out, keep people like Mark off your property. You want a fence, okay? So <laughs> how about this? Before you guys go, we're going to look at one common mistake, get you guys thinking about something before you run away. Okay, I'm going to go down here, and we're going to go with, whoops, I don't want to sign out. We're going to go with the mistake of the week before you guys run away. <laughs> Mark made a fence for his wife. It's interesting. It's an interesting wedding present, Mark. Um, all right, so the mistake of the week, guys, as usual, I'm going to show you something on the screen, and I want you guys to put the answer in the chat. So here's the sentence. Can you spot the mistake? Um, here's my sentence. I'm going to disappear, and I want to see who can find the mistake the fastest. Whoever can find the mistake first is the king or queen of the internet for the rest of the day. All right? Okay, so I'm popping off. Find the mistake in this sentence. Where's the mistake? Go for it. All right, so this one's, this one's a tricky one, maybe. And it's a little, it's just a little mistake, but it's something that I hear students say all the time. And I haven't seen anybody get it yet. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm the king of the internet today, maybe, yeah? Because I see a lot of good ideas, but the thing, I, I guess maybe this is a little bit unfair, because oftentimes I, I give you a mistake that's sometimes connected to the lesson. Marianne doesn't see it either. I know it's really, it's really small, it's really minor. Um, but it is a little thing that, um, that students do all the time. S lots of answers still coming in, but nobody sees it. Okay, so having nothing important to do the next day and no reason to go home, we ended up staying up late discussing about our future plans. So in this case, and I think um, Chateau 7 saw something about um, discussing. He, he suggested it should be late to discuss, and that would be fine. You can, dis you can say to discuss or, or discussing. And some of you are thinking it has to do with having nothing or anything or something like that. But actually, it's just a little one. It's just this. Let me show you. About. That's all. I hear students say it all the time. Discuss about. 
right? Typically, we don't, you don't follow discuss with about. You don't have to discuss about something because the word discuss means um, talk about, okay? So um, you don't use the preposition about after discuss. You simply discuss future plans. So we ended up staying up late discussing our future plans, not discussing about <laughs> future plans. Yeah, Karim sees how excited I am that I, I stumped the internet. I'm so happy. You guys are usually so quick to find my mistakes and all I want to do is, is trick you and yeah, you've made me so happy today. <laughs> so, um, Sean is the winner. I'm the winner, okay? Awesome. So this is what you, you want to look out for. Just don't use the word about after discuss. And that's, and that's it. Joko says he knew that. Is it jo Joko? Am I saying that right? D-J-O. Sounds like, looks like a J sound maybe. I don't know. Um, questions coming in. I can't believe none of the scholars got out. Oh, John's there. Hey, yeah, good. All right, good to see you, John. <laughs> okay. Bruno likes the tip. I'm glad you like it. All right, guys, so that um, is all the time we have for today. I've had lots of fun, as, as always. I always look forward to this class. Um, it's lots of fun. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something, um, and I hope you come back next week. Uh, again, don't forget, if, if you're not a member of our group on Facebook, learn English on Facebook, um, join our group, and... Uh, Mark is always there answering questions. I, I pop in and answer questions sometimes. Karim is there too. Lots of teachers helping out. Um, and yeah, like us on Facebook. Check out more videos and classes that you may have missed on, on our channel. And um, keep on coming back next week and the week after that. And tell your friends and spread the word. And let's get more people in this um, massive classroom that we have here. Okay? So thanks for coming, guys. And we'll see you next week. Remember to watch Mark's class earlier um, on Wednesdays. And then obviously I'm at this time. And keep studying. Keep using your English. And how about I'll stick around in the chat for a couple minutes just in case you guys have any, any questions. And we'll see you next time. All right? Okay. See you guys. <laughs>